Okay, so today, guys, we are back with the Mark States Guide, and today we'll be talking about the impact of shot taking on our mental game. Now, the reason I wanted to make this video, guys, is because I recently took a shot at 50 NL myself, and I played a hand that I feel illustrates quite well the topic that I want to talk about today. So what we're going to do today, guys, is we're going to look at the hand as it was played live, first of all, and then we're going to jump into Poker Scientist to have a look at how this should be played from a theoretical standpoint. And then after that, I'm going to talk personally about how I feel the fact that I was shot taking affected my mental game and therefore my decision making process in the hand in question. If you do enjoy the video, guys, please do consider subscribing and dropping a like on the video. It really helps me out. But for now, let's go and take a look at the hand. I'm feeling quite exhausted from playing this session. Like mentally, I've been fo focusing very, very hard. Um, I'm going to raise this up. 50 and L. Obviously 50 and L because 25 and L hasn't moved from 100 big blinds all fucking night. Start with the bet. I think we can even go probably smaller. Just go, go for that. Called very fast. I think we do still want to bet again here. So let's do that. We obviously have a very strong range. We also can bang it off on the river. We didn't. It's not going to stop us, guys. Can't shy away from it. Oh, damn it. So that was the hand, guys. And now this is Poker Scientist. Now, like I said, we're going to look at this hand from a theoretical standpoint. Now, I know I have not been through Poker Scientist um, and how it works just yet with you guys. Um, but hopefully, it will be self-explanatory for the most part. Now, first thing we're going to do is select the positions, which was middle position against the small blind. We'll now select the action, which was the middle position opening, us three betting from the small blind, and then a call from middle position. Now you can see the ranges as they are assigned. These are solved ranges. Um, and then we are to select a flop. Now, one thing to quickly mention is that our actual flop was um, Ace of Diamonds, Queen of Spades, Deuce of Hearts. Um, and what the program will do is give us a canonical flop, which means uh, effectively, theoretically, the, the, same, the same board, but it will change a few things about our particular combo. Now, obviously, Having jacked in a spades in this situation is quite different to having jacked in diamonds, and we'll go into the reasons for that soon. Um, so we'll have to bear that in mind as we go forward. But uh, with the flop selected, we can now go through to the flop situation. Um, and as you can see, um, obviously, um, as I may well have touched on in the hand itself, uh, we do have obviously a very strong range, and we do want to continue here most of the time, 82% of the time to be exact. Um, and you can see when you hover over this button here that um, we have... Yeah, a small bet with most of our range, uh, and that makes sense, right? We're not going to spend too much time going into that because I do want to get to the crux of the topic that I want to talk about today, um, which is the impact of shot taking on our mental game. So we do decide to go over the small bet, which is completely fine. And our opponent um, is going to call 52% of the time, and this is the range that he will call with. Um, makes a ton of sense. Uh, you know, some, some Queen X um, in there, some Ace X, obviously, and he's going to be folding those... Um, obviously this grey area here is going to be folding all of these nothing hands that have no potential a couple of um, backdoor straight draws and things like that but for the most part um, you know ace jack, ace 10 queen x, ace king stuff like that will continue um, so he does go ahead and do so so now what we need to do is select a turn so we go to view turn run and we get this cool screen here that shows us how good each individual card is for ourselves and for our opponent um, you can see that um, the deuce is quite good for us in general and also the middling cards but when it gets to the broader area it's a little bit more even if not in favor of in position so what we'll do is go to select a turn cluster and we need a rainbow deuce which is what we will select and then we'll go to the turn action um, which is here now this shows us our turn strategy now um, we did decide to go for uh, the larger bet here um, we're predominantly checking here um, as you can see, this is what our range looks like. Obviously, once we bet the flop at such a high frequency, we are going to have a bunch of checks on the turn. Um, but if we do decide to go ahead and bet this larger sizing, this is what it's going to look like generally. Um, we've got obviously some ace-king, makes a lot of sense, ace-queen. Um, and what do our bluffs look like? Obviously, we've got some traps obviously there as well with aces. What do our bluffs look like? Um, now, you might notice that um, jack-10 is not really featuring, and we'll talk about why that might be uh, in just a second here. But you can see that nines, eights, sevens, sixes, and fives, and five, four are a lot more popular. Um, in terms of Broadway bluffs, uh, it looks like that King Jack and King 10 are our favorite ones. So whenever you do something like this, guys, you want to think about why um, it's using the certain hands that it's using um, in this situation to bluff, uh, such as King 10 and King Jack. 
Um, and obviously having a king is great because we block things like ace king, which obviously is what our opponent ends up having, which is definitely something that he can have at a decent frequency and something that will certainly call us down. So having a king is really good. Obviously, when we have jack 10, we don't have a king. And another thing about jack 10 is that we can block um, things such as ace jack and ace 10 suited that may well fold to multiple barrels by the river. Now, what is interesting to note, guys, is that jack 10, um, our combo specifically, doesn't actually mind going for a bet. Um, so you can see on the right here the frequency of which we would decide to use a 25 big uh, big blind bet here. Um, now, what, remember what I said before about um, the fact that you want to remember that uh, our combo of jack 10 of spades, um, while we're using a canonical flop here, um, our combo on this particular board would be jack 10 of diamonds um, because the queen is a diamond. And that makes a big difference because as you can see here, the jack 10 of diamonds is actually barreling at 14% frequency, whereas the other ones are barreling almost never. And the reason for that is that um, once we do bet, which we've selected here, our opponent will continue with things like king-queen suited. Now, he never has king-queen offsuit, but he will continue with stuff like queen-jack suited and king-queen suited, um, both of which could fold by the river. Now, obviously, if we do have jack-10 of diamonds um, in this case, then we don't block any combos of um, queen-x suited, so he will you know, usually continue with those and then maybe perhaps fold them by the river. So it makes a much better bluff than the others, the others do. Um, having said that, they're still not great because they do block ace jack and ace 10 suited. Um, and we would rather just uh, have a bluff that doesn't interact with the board uh, anywhere near as much as our particular hand does or doesn't block our opponent's folding range by the river. Um, and so really for that, you're kind of looking like using those eight sevens and sixes or using um, one of those king x broadways um, as we've spoken about to block ace king. Now, ideally versus our turn barrel, our opponent will respond um, like this. Um, so calling around 55% of the time. And like we said, calling this stuff like king queen, obviously ace king, ace queen, ace jack, ace 10, all those ace x hands are not folding yet, but some of them may give up by the river, um, which is why it's important not to block some of the weaker ace x hands that our opponent may potentially fold by the river. Um, but obviously, um, as played, we did go for the barrel and our opponent went for the call. Um, now, one thing we can say that we may mention later, obviously we're not playing in theory in these games. This, play, this uh, opponent was a decent regular from what I I've been able to ascertain so far. Um, there is an argument to be made that uh, they may fold the turn with Queen X more than they should. Obviously, here we can see that you're never supposed to fold, but I think that's not going to be entirely the case um, in practice. So they do go for the call, and now we are faced with a river. So we have the four of hearts. Um, so as you can see here again, we get this rather um, pretty looking graph, if you will that shows us how good each individual card is for um, each player now obviously you can see in position is doing really well on these low cards now because we're bluffing these sevens and eights um a bunch these these turns actually become uh, these rivers actually become quite good for us um whereas uh, in position is actually doing quite well on the, on the broadway runouts um as you can see um from the ranges that we looked at on the turn for each player that makes a bunch of sense right so we'll select the four of hearts which is the river that we do get um, but any four is obviously fine because none of them uh, make any flushes. And then you can see our river strategy here. Now, what are the kind of things we're going to get to this river with that we want to shove for value? And what do we want to shove as a bluff? Now, you can see that Jack-10 is now, we can actually show you this um, in particular. Jack-10 is now um, pretty disastrous to go ahead and bluff. We're losing quite a lot of EV there. Um, for the reasons that we said on the turn, we just don't want to be blocking our opponent's ace X hands that may fold. Um... We'd much rather have a king. You can see it's doing it a, um, a significant chunk more, even especially like king 10 of diamonds, as we spoke about having those diamonds um, to unblock those queen X um, hands that would call the turn and then hopefully fold the river um, is a lot better than having those other king X suited combos. So that combo itself will make a great bluff as well. But most of the time we want to be bluffing these others sixes, sevens, eights for the reasons that we've spoken about um, because they don't interact with the with the board as well and our opponent we unblock more of our opponent's folds um for the river so for value we've got stuff like um ace king ace queen um obviously uh, checking those aces trapping those aces if we have them here um uh, value with queens obviously all makes good sense right and then our bluffs these hands down here as we've as we have talked about and when we look at how our opponent is supposed to respond to a shove on the river we can start to see why jack 10 becomes this pretty significant mistake um, or starts to become more of a mistake um, than the others because, as you can see here, our opponent always calls with these 
ace king hand, which obviously king x uh, king 10 of diamonds for example will block whereas jack 10 doesn't and what jack 10 does do is unblock um some of these ace 10 and ace jack hands which as you can see are not supposed to be calling all the time so it does make a pretty big difference um to unblock those um in terms of what hands we choose so obviously if we start bluffing with jack 10 and um king 10 and, and sixes and sevens and eights we're gonna have way too much going on guys so um very important to keep that in mind um and yeah our opponent just wants to respond by calling with his very strong aces um obviously those traps uh, like ace queen and queens um and yeah ace four obviously that, that makes two pair on the river but a lot of his ace x is calling but you know enough of it is folding to to the point where having jack 10 is, is, a, is a pretty is a pretty significant issue for us now in theory guys you can see that i've made quite a significant error in my bluff selection um in this hand now i want to get on to more about the topic of this video precisely which is the impact that shot taking can have on your mental game now uh, i want to show you a few clips that will really illustrate what i'm talking about here and then we're going to come back and talk about it in a little bit more detail we didn't it's not going to stop us guys can't shy away from it super pleased with like, i didn't shy away from the bluff but yeah I'm, I'm, I'm proud that i took a shot um we ended up losing money at the end of the day but um we were in there and we didn't shy away from the big decisions and uh, we made some big calls and we made some big bluffs okay so you guys might be able to figure out what exactly i'm going to talk about now um you'll notice that i repeatedly say that i'm happy that i didn't shy away from the bluff in this situation um now that is obviously a terrible reason uh, to follow through with the bluff um i remember at the time thinking uh, solely on the basis that i've got jack high um Oh, I could, you know, I could check here and I could lose, but I don't want to, I don't want to shy away from it. I don't want to, you know, move up to 50 and then get to this point and then, and then check fold because it's 50 and I'm on scared money. Um, I've got, you know, I've got to, I've got to follow through. Um, and that is not the thought process that we should be taking when we decide whether we should bluff or not. All the things that we've just spoken about are the things that we should think about when we're deciding whether a candidate is good to bluff, to bluff with it or not. The fact that I'm playing at 50 now shouldn't have any bearing on my decision making whatsoever in this situation. Uh, I should purely be thinking on the basis of what I like about my combo um, as a bluff and what I dislike it about as a bluff and what other hands I would have that would make more sense or less sense um, to go ahead and follow through with. Now, I'm definitely not saying that at 25 and L, I wouldn't have punted this into the middle at some frequency. What I'm saying is that at least my first thought wouldn't have been I need to I need to be brave here and, and follow through. It would have been what do I like about this combo? Um and my only limiting factor to whether I made the right decision or not would have been my pokering ability, not some other mental external factor. And I do think if I'd used my time to think about that rather than the fact that it was at 50 and I wanted to follow through to be brave, then I would have had a much better chance, at least given myself somewhat of a chance to check fold at some point in this hand and make a better decision. So what I'm saying is, at least in some part, I think that the shot take clouded my judgment in this spot. Um, I fully back myself to be capable enough. I mean, these are, you know, the, these are advanced concepts, guys, but um, it's not like they're foreign to me. I do understand them completely and, and why we might choose one combo over another. And if I'd given myself some time and I'd used my time bank to think about those things rather than the other things that I was thinking about, then I definitely would have given myself a chance to make a good decision here. Um, as it happens, I didn't. Um, and I do feel like that played a part. It's really not good enough for me to say, I've got Jack high, it's 50 and L and you know, I need to show that I'm capable of following through at this stake. Um, it's still poker. Um, no matter what the stake is, we're playing poker when we move up and the game is the same. Uh, the game only becomes not the same in our mind. And yes, that can absolutely have an effect, but it's really, really important, um, to separate yourself from the fact that you're playing a different stake and make your best poker decision possible in the situation or at least give yourself the chance to do so um like i said i think if i'd given myself a little bit of time to think about my combo rather than just saying i've got jack high i may well have realized that this was not the best combo to bluff and that we do have better combos now obviously in the heat of the moment that is a difficult thing to come out with but at least i would have given myself you know a non-zero chance of doing so some other things to consider are that in practice uh, my turn bet and even in theory, you can see my turn bet does condense our opponent quite a lot towards ace x. Um, and 
I don't know if we're really going to expect to see many folds by the river. Now that's that's not even necessarily very advanced. Um, obviously the jack and the ten uh, blocker to ace ten and ace jack that might fold. Um, you know that's not necessarily even advanced either. But in in, in the most basic in the most basic form of, of thinking, we made a rather large turn barrel and our opponent called on a very dry board. Um, and he's going to have a lot of very strong ASEX, and I really don't think we're going to extract the kind of folds we need to extract here, it's particularly with a combo that, that blocks some of his folds, um, in order to make this play anywhere near profitable. And as we as we've already discussed, this is this is burning, burning EV. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I just thought this was an interesting thing to talk about today. I feel like personally, my shot taking uh, and how that affected my mental game definitely um, hindered me in making the correct decision, at least in this situation. Um, not that I definitely would have made the right decision if it had been a different stake, but I, I think it's really, really important to note that we're still playing poker and we still want to make our best poker decision. And this is the kind of thing that can happen if you're allowing other things to take control of your brain at the most important moments. So while I feel like I could talk about this hand for a lot longer, I do want to keep this video length in keeping with the rest of the microstakes guide. Um, and I do feel like I've already touched on the main concept of this video, which was uh, the impact that shot taking can have on your mental game. Also, guys, if you do like the look of Poker Scientist, then I do have a code. It's EST with three Ys, 22. I'll leave a link in the description below. And you can use that to get 20% off all packages on PokerScientist.com. If you have enjoyed this episode, guys, then please do consider subscribing to the channel. Also, dropping a like on the video. It really helps me out. If you do have any questions at all, you can drop those in the comments below. I do endeavor to reply to as many as possible. Um, but for now, guys, that's going to do it. Take care, stay safe, and I will see you on the next one.